uh, Russell, I'll just throw straight over to you. Thanks, Charlie. Fantastic. Um, congratulations, Andrew. Great, uh, great presentation. I was uh, not surprised the three questions on Valve, so we've got to get this going in the right way. But before we do, in Luke's presentation this morning, he spoke about the fact that BHP and Rio Tinto can't talk together. But if I'm hosting, uh, I'm, I'm hosting you from um, behind the wall of Palaszczuk, and uh, good old Luke over there uh, representing uh, uh, the, the great state of, uh, of Victoria, apparently. Um, any chance the information on that Valve you know, can be have the same naming convention and the same tagging system and, you know, a couple of those things. What do you think? <laughs> hey, a bit of standardisation? Well, yeah. I mean, you're so, talking to a former piping engineer here. Yeah. Um, yeah. And even every, so my experience working in oil and gas, they all had different naming conventions to what that valve actually talked to. But there's only one or two places where you can go buy that valve. But it might be, they do that because you'll have different service requirements, so different fluids, different pressures, different whatever. Um, and they build out their piping specs and have common valves um, or bespoke valves depending on need. But, but the information's in I and BIM, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, and look, uh, Luke touched on it, um, but the Australasian BIM Advisory Board, uh, which I chair, we are, w wanting to, we are working with all jurisdictions across Australia. Commonwealth um, isn't participating at the moment, but we're hoping that might change. To look at how we can get that standardisation, that normalisation, if you like, um, to ensure that there are minimum requirements that come in. Right now, that, that's a big lift, you know, a, big, a big ask, as, as Luke mentioned. Um, every jurisdiction has their own approach. We are dealing with cultural change, um, but through the 2020s, I mean, I think this is something that the, the sector and all levels of government should be focused on to try and improve that um, information exchange. Um, and of course, you then get the, the critics that say, oh no, well, that, that, you know, you're creating a socialist state, it's all the same. It's like, no, no, what we're trying to do is improve outcomes for the taxpayer, right, so that we can drive the, the capital dollars, the constrained capital dollars further. No, thanks. Uh, a great little uh, close out uh, before we move into our topic for, for moderation. So it is with great pleasure we get to moderate this great panel. And uh, topic, advancing the construction industry. Well, we could ask that at any given time in history, and we'll be able to ask it in the future, but I suppose in brackets, post uh, the pandemic. So uh, from our point of view, um, I guess working through just uh, the session, uh, in the interest of Alan Joyce's on-time departure, we are going to finish promptly at 12. Uh, so Amanda's going to kick me in the leg if I go beyond that. Um, but, but also what we'll do, we'll, we'll have a, a window of uh, opportunity for questions from the floor, um, prob probably around quarter to 12, and then I will close out with some, uh, I was going to say closing argument, but it sounds like lawyers, doesn't it? But we'll close out with a little bit of uh, recommendation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So nothing like fact, uh, fact opinion recommendation. Um, welcome to you, Murray, to the forum. Um, great to have you in. We've had John up yesterday presenting and um, participating, so um, great to have Murray. Just for, for what quick way of background, Murray, I don't know how many years it was, mate, but whatever it was, it's over 30 years, spectacular career at Lend Lease, uh, uh, including being the managing director of, uh, of Lend Lease uh, Build and Construct, and then um, with Macquarie now. So just helping call that out a little bit in terms of, uh, of your fantastic uh, knowledge and history, and we're looking forward to your thought leadership. Um, advancing construction industry, I'm just gonna get this, uh, get this underway, and I'm gonna lead to you, Murray, um, being, being up on the panel. Um, if every state government in Australia and the federal government are backing a building and construction-led recovery, and every country that I listen to, whether it's, uh, uh, I was going to say, our friends in the US, uh, Joe, um, are all doing the same. How are we going to go with the rising market? And how are we going to work our way through uh, this next period of time? And perhaps what are you seeing from a number of lenses that you can cast over that? Yeah, that's a, lot. That's a big question. Um, I'm not sure we've got long enough for my answer. But... <laughs> But what I would say is, look, at, you know, it's very interesting times, very difficult times, because uh, there's no question inflation is really bitten now. And, and you look at, you know, the numbers in the US is kind of 8% plus, and, you and, know, Australia's about kind of the middle of the pack at about 5 and so we've kind of got Germany and the UK are worse than us, and others are better than us, and China, of course, is, is uh, 
way down low, but uh, I saw some interesting numbers this morning we're talking about the cost of living and the impact and the cost of an annual shop and the cost of normal goods and services, the cost of meat, the co you know, all those kinds of things. And Australia's broadly in the middle of the pack, but when you look at affordability in Australia, it's, it's, it's uh, increased in the middle of the pack compared to the rest of the world. Um, but there's no question that the cost of living is rising. There's no question that you know, we're caught in one of those uh, things in the construction industry at the moment in Australia where, where materials have dramatically increased in some areas and, uh, and labour's... Okay, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was told I didn't have to do anything. Um, and I'm good at that. So, um, uh, so there's no question that we're in this kind of... Uh, we're right in this zone at the moment. And, and it's not what we used to call escalation or rise and fall. It's really more a market shift. And we're seeing that considerably now. And if you've been pricing or contractors have been pricing on fixed price lump sum, there's nowhere for them to go really, and it's, and it's pretty tricky. And, uh, you know, I'm sure we're gonna see, um, see uh, a few issues in the next 12 to 18 months. That's not to be confused with some things that have more recently happened. So we've had one or two contractors go under and where that's been blamed on that, not really. If you look at the history of those organisations, those issues have been around for quite a while. Um, so, but you're right, I mean, I think in the US and, and Australia to some extent are talking about a construction-led recovery, you know, is that political rhetoric? I mean, the, the, the uh, very fortunate thing about the construction industry in Australia during the pandemic is um, a lot, for, in New South Wales, the construction industry was only shut down for two weeks. We had eight LGAs that, were, that effectively shut part of the industry for, for, for a bit longer, probably about another six weeks. But in Victoria, I know it was dramatically affected for a period of time. Um, but by and large, compared to a lot of other industries, the construction industry did pretty well. And I know there are some major projects, uh, the, the new stadium, for example, in New South Wales, that, that you know, quite significantly benefited from being able to operate uh, during the pandemic because there's far less traffic on the road, they could move all their spoil, they could bring all the gear in. It was significantly different. And also in the CBD, um, the, uh, the, the planning conditions were altered on the metro projects, for example, that they could pretty much work 24-7, mm. um, which makes a massive difference. So you're advocating an extension of the pandemic, Murray? Because <laughs> <laughs> it, it, keeps, it, it keeps giving. I mean, well, it does that's, keep that, giving. That's, that's kind of one perspective, but that's probably, that's probably more a plumber's perspective <laughs> or a fitter's perspective, <laughs> oh, Russell. Fine, uh, no, I, I, think, I think for me it shows what can happen when... Mm. When, uh, when regulatory authorities and governments and councils, et cetera, are a bit more flexible. But I, I think, the, coming back to the point of it, I think that it is going to be difficult times, I think, in the short term with, with this kind of market shift in pricing. And I'm not sure we're over yet. I mean, you know, on a couple of major projects we're involved with, we are watching very, very carefully what's happening in China at the moment with the lockdowns. We're very concerned there's going to be further extensive lockdowns. We are, we're finding it... Uh, difficult to still get uh, materials and kit out of China again. The ports are locked up. You can't move from one province to another. A lot of the factories have slowed down again. Uh, so if you're looking for facades or, or other, you know, particularly subcomponentry, which a lot of different contractors rely on, uh, there's a very limited supply. Shipping prices, of course, have gone through the roof. Um, but you've got to get your stuff onto a boat and get out of a port, and there's a massive queue up. There's some very interesting uh, things on the web at the moment where you can see the amount of shipping that's sitting outside Beijing and sitting outside Shanghai. It's quite amazing, actually. Mind, it's absolutely mind-blowing. Yeah, when you look so, at it. Uh, so I think it's going to be tough, Russell. No, that's a really good sort of lead into the economic uh, sort of overview. And I guess, you know, weaving that back into, obviously, digital transformation, uh, huge change really in the last couple of years but sometimes you look at these things and go that you mentioned Andrew there's a cultural piece here or how do people behave I guess what I'm probably looking a little bit to you Luke um, you know there's things that um, yeah, you can reflect on maybe there's some fads that have now emerged as trends maybe there's some trends that are um, perhaps not really as trendy as we thought they were or trending as, as we thought they were um, in your, your mind looking through and, and sort of looking through your timeline and, and the, the strategy, is any 
winners in terms of advancement? Is any things that you feel lagging behind just with the environment that we've been living through? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult one. Because uh, you also compare civil construction to other industries where they are a lot more advanced in sort of digital uh, aspects and, and uh, productivity on projects. Um, and I'd say there's, in government, there's a whole machine behind delivering projects from ministers, central agencies, departments, delivery agencies, um, contractors that all need to be on the same page. They're all the people that you need to target to, to get this behavioural change happening, um, to change from you know, a very traditional approach that's been done for thousands of years <laughs> to something that's a bit more modern. Um, so to get that you know, iPhone moment of, of uh, construction uh, is, is, is very difficult. I mean, you go back to the, the sort of the change methodologies and the change approaches that you need to, to think about, you know, um, without going to management consultant lingo, you know, eight stages for change based on Cotter theorem. Um, you have to build your, 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 your burning platform. And I think these challenges with cost escalation with um, so many projects that uh, we're seeing huge increases in wage growth for contractors, we're seeing huge increases across the board and uh, challenges in delivering projects. I think that's a huge opportunity to actually do something differently and challenge behaviour and say, we've got a good reason to change now. Um, how about we adopt some of those technologies? Don't worry, those technologies do work. They have been proven to work in, in other jurisdictions or in other industries. It's not a huge leap. Let's get on board and drive consistency and do better. Um, we, we need to do that. Uh, and that involves um, you know, the old people, process, and, and systems. Um, systems are there. Processes need a hell lot of improvement. And people need the, the training and understanding and, and the desire to move towards a better way of working. Yeah, I think the interesting thing, Luke, it's, uh, it's been two years of training for a lot of people. Like, I don't think I know anyone who hasn't improved their technology uptake, uh, you know. So, you know, we all know how to share screen. We can push the model around. It's, you know, there's some advancements there. You know how to turn off mute. Yeah, no, 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 do that. Well, you put a fining system in place. That's how you get that working. But you always got to be some penalties. Andrew, just while we're on that subject, you know, you're in a, an interesting role. Have you, have you seen those sort of opportunities to really advance things with, with looking at it through, uh, through that uh, lens of opportunity? Yeah, look, there's a, a lot of opportunities, Russell. I mean, one of the big things that we saw, particularly at the start of the pandemic, was that um, a lot of our uh, engineering and roads contractors had resisted moving from a wet signature to an electronic signature on plans. Okay, there was a 10-year conversation that had been happening with the sector from sort of around 2010, right? When the decision was taken by the Palaszczuk government to send everybody home, you know, particularly in government... It was just for a weekend, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was only going to be a couple Three of weeks. days or something? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Within two days, you know, the engineering companies said, we will move from wet signatures to digital signatures because they could see there was no other way that they could do it in that environment. Mm. So it can be done. Cultural change can happen. Um, there's now some enthusiasm to, and th this is one of the, the sets of words that I really despise about the pandemic, going back to normal, right? We need to build on what we've achieved to make sure that we use this as a platform for the future, not regressing. Yeah, def yeah, well, well, applause, Andrew. Keep it going. <laughs> no, no. What's the new normal? There's, some vo there's a vote to work from home. I heard it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just want to, I just want to point out one thing. Um, there is no I in team. There is one in victory. There's five in individual brilliance, and we've got a lot of those in the room. And there's actually a couple in flexible working arrangements. But um, there is, there is that real need to match back up, and um, you know, and I think you know, we're talking about resetting. We're talking about the opportunities. So. Uh, really well articulated, Andrew. John, I'm looking at you and I'm looking at the wisdom because you're like me, mate. The, the grey hair is not all for my old age. You'd hope there's a little bit of wisdom in there, mate. So thank you for your contribution to the forum so far and, and also the, the, uh, the, the dinner opening uh, before opening. Um, just coming back on that sort of um, trends and fads, um, you're, you've got 
an interesting place. So obviously, there's an opportunity for DEXIS to acquire AMP in, in some sort of opportunity. Um, but just looking at it also from a user point of view and what you're seeing in the space, what, what are you seeing are the trends and fads that are emerging in the context of advancing going forward? I think that um, it's been said here before that there's been some amazing digital tool sets available for a long, long time. It's not a technology problem. It's the adoption of it and actually using it to its maximum power. I've seen um, people using AutoCAD and Revit for a long, long time, but not really maximizing the full potential of the product. And I think that there's an opportunity for a real increase in skill set. I, 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 what I really worry about two things, supply chain, skills. They're going to be the biggest thing that impacts us over the next few years. So I think if we take this opportunity to really understand the, the value that the technology can give us, and spend our time upskilling and really getting those products to work for us, I think you'll see there'll be a natural shift to just continue to use that technology going forward. And, and from a, I suppose, from a, a user point of view in terms of tenants and, and things, what, what are you seeing there in terms of workplaces, uh, well, well, wellness in buildings, those, those sort of things? What, how, how are you seeing that? Because obviously, you know, there was a, you know, a strong, obviously the working from home and remote part, but there's also, you know, the need for collaboration. People do want to get reconnected socially, but we all want to stay nicely 1.5 metres apart and some other things we've had drilled into us for a while. And I think, obviously, there has been some a lot of change in behaviour about attendance. How are you sort of seeing that side? I think it's all too fresh at the moment. Like I was saying the other day, we've, um, we've been in recovery mode and survival mode, if you like, over the last couple of years. I think we're now... We don't really know what the new norm is going to look like, to be honest with you. Um, we can only guess. But from the leasing perspective, leasing is still pretty strong, which I, th I think we weren't really sure about how that would look, but it is looking really, really strong at the moment. Um, but there are questions coming from the customer sector about, so do we need to talk more about air quality? Do we need to talk about density of floor plates, how many people we've got on the floor plates? So the questions are coming up now that, have not really been raised before. So obviously we're doing a lot of research to work out how we have some good answers to all of that. But it's all too new, as I say. I think we're just at the back end of the survival mode. So we'll have to see how the next couple of years pan out. Yeah, that, it's sort of like, let's get back on the horse and, and make sure we embrace the new normal, but we're not quite sure what that is yet. You yeah, know, what, what I would say is that the whole virtual working, we know the technology is good for us, but technology cannot replace the human element. <coughs> And I'm, I think we're all pretty concerned about what's going to happen in, to mental we welfare yeah. going forward. Yep. And so there's, there's, I think there's going to be some problems that come out the back of it. And I think that when Sydney opened up, there was this natural kind of, I want to go back, you know? And like I was saying the other day, that to, to go back into the office and see Sydney coming alive and being able to talk to your peers, have those corridor conversations, it's really quite a powerful emotion about mm. I'm allowed out again and, and it's you know Absolutely. so I think naturally the cities will get filled again um, unfortunately the, the roads will get busy again <laughs> but I think there'll be a natural um, migration back into the office space. Yeah and I, and I think if you got a list pre-pandemic and wrote all the important things about workplace and uh, yep. you know coming out of you know talking about you know thriving and and really going forward uh, where we've been in survival mode, and they would be. The mm -hmm. collaboration workspaces, the ability to socialise and, you know, link technology to way, the way people work. So, yeah. um, Murray, just, um, I suppose, looking at the, at the industry through a number of lenses, but just looking through the, the lens of an owner for a moment and, and just sort of picking up on, on John from sort of a, you know, a Dexus, not just a Dexus view, it's a John view, but, you know, that overview. Um, how, are, how are you seeing, what, what are the sorts of things that you'd be looking for? Um, well, I'm not sure I quite share uh, John's view about there'll be a natural kind of progression back into the office. I, you know, I think another view is that you know we 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 did get to a certain fork in the road, and whereas some will come back, I suspect some won't co back, come back the same. I think there's still there's a quite substantive cohort uh, of employees in a range of industries that kind of think two or three days at work is kind of where they'd like to settle. And, uh, you know, they saw, they say, eight weeks to develop a new habit. Well, they've had two years. <laughs> and, and, um, and, and I think it's for different types of roles. I think client-facing roles, team-oriented roles, much more likely to come back 
uh, in, and we're certainly seeing that. Uh, the, the younger, our, our graduates, our analysts, people who learn by osmosis and being around people, they've hurried back into the office. You know, they've been sick of sitting in their bedrooms all day on their laptops when, in a share house, and I can understand that. And the, the next biggest group were are those with young children. <laughs> yeah. So the, yeah. the well, parents the have abandoned is better than home school. school. Better than home school, <laughs> mate. What's that? Coming to the office is better than homeschooling. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. But, but, you know, and I think, you know, it's always an interesting, uh, interesting perspective you get from the REITs and commercial developers because I guess they have to believe that's all going to happen and that it's all going to come back. Otherwise, they've got to look at fundamental shifts in their, in their model. So time will tell. I, I, I think the jury's out. And I think yeah. you're right in saying that it's all very fresh. It's just fantastic to be able to come back in the office and, and particularly you know, the masks have all gone and talk to people and actually have the benefit of their body language when you're speaking to them to actually understand. Mm -hmm. and funnily enough, I was on a plane yesterday coming down to Melbourne and I recognised three people coming down the aisle with their masks on. And it's amazing how the human <laughs> mind adapts. You can recognise people yeah, yeah. with... Yeah. Just looking at the others. Much, just, just seeing across their eyes. Yeah. So... So, um, but, but, but not having that ability to see people, you know, see their whole uh, face when you communicate, or even if you're on Zoom or some version of that, you know, the, you don't really get the body language. And, you know, we've had bids and pitches where we've allocated people to watch certain people to try and get a take on their body language when we've been bidding and pitching something. It's a whole different game. So what's the, what's the body language call when someone's doing their own emails and looking out the window, mate? Have you got the disengagement <laughs> flag comes up? Or? Or, what's, or what's it like in a board uh, meeting when someone's on their phone all the time, Russell? Yes, no, I've seen that firsthand. I know what you mean, Murray. Um, Tremendous. Um, Luke, getting you in the game had nothing, Murray. Too much, too much thought leadership. Um, too much thought leadership. Uh, Luke, uh, we're talking a lot, obviously, um, and again, I just want to reiterate, you're in the, you, this is your chance. We've got all these people online around, not just in Australia, but we've got great delegations in Japan and US and um, I don't know how my jokes are going down in Japan at the moment, but, um, uh, and, and across Europe and the UK. Um, just your message in, in how we get behind what you're doing, um, and then also tying that back into Andrew. Um, how does the industry respond? And at the end of the day, you know, I really do acknowledge your um, alignment and, and support of what we've been doing. But yeah, from your point of view, what's a bit of a message? I think it is as simple as just give it a go. Uh, there, we've had a concerted effort to try and simplify the language, um, to try and make it a bit more tangible for people. Um, and this goes right through to, you know, people who are making decisions on projects that have never delivered a project themselves. Make it in their language. Um, try and um, demystify it and simplify the language so that people can go, oh, is that what you're talking about? Um, so we've, we've tried a whole raft of different things and put it into different language, like we're dealing with contracts. So hopefully get those commercial people on board and understand you know, what the design engineering processes are around. What do you mean by um, common data environment? Oh, you mean just to somewhere where you can put your files and everyone can see what they, they look and you can make decisions through that, through that portal. Oh, OK, that makes sense. Um, rather than something that sounds really complicated and, and um, uh, un, un, untouchable. Um, so making things really tangible and really accessible because I think that's, that's really where we need to go to. So all those people at home, um, make, it, make it tangible. Yeah, make it simple. Um, make it so that everyone can use it and, uh, and you don't need a degree in engineering or you, know, you need to be a town planner or you know, uh, go through years of education to be able to uh, engage with it. Uh, really well summarised, mate. And Andrew, do you want to just add anything to that? From yeah, look, just, just keep it simple, okay. but keep engaging. You know, embrace the change that's coming, because if we don't embrace change, we, we're lost. Right. So as as a, as a sector, as an industry, we've got to lift. You know, construction from number two above honey and fishing, right, <laughs> much higher up, because there are enormous opportunities for the sector. There are enormous opportunities for careers. There are enormous opportunities through the life cycle of assets. Yeah. 
Well, and and I, I guess some of us in the in the room and the stats and they they count, but you know there's a lot of people that are doing a lot more than hunting and fishing oh, in, yeah. in this room, and and I think. That, that's the challenge and, you know, particularly encouraged, you know, p particularly with the Victorian Government and the Queensland yes, Connection, yes. exemplar is what drives mm. things, you know, lifting yeah. the bar Absolutely. and holding the line on quality, those uh, sorts of things uh, mm. that, that really get things along and I think that's uh, an, an enormous opportunity. Um, just sort of, just a little bit on that theme, Do you anything to add there, Murray? Yeah, on, I, yeah? I mean, for me, I mean, you know, I think someone said earlier that these digital tools and the technology has been around for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Those who decided to take this up, you know, gradually progress with this. The bit I scratch my head about, if you sit around and wait for this forever, it's going to be forever. Mm -hmm. And why wouldn't and why don't governments contemplate mandating this, at least at a pilot space, at least in certain industries, at least for... You know, I think you're kind of heading towards that yeah. mm -hmm. by saying, you, you, you know, you're 10 million plus, and, but, you know harder mandates, mm. you know, certain sectors, non-negotiables, support with training, support with technology funding if needs be. If you want to shift the dial, this isn't about the people who get it and are engaged. It's actually about shifting the industry, right? Yeah. And if you want to shift the industry, sometimes you've got to go from compulsion to commitment. Love it, Murray. Jesus, I'd, I'm, I'm going to put that down in the uh, in the the book of coaches address. That was fantastic, mate. No, great message. Um, before we fly to the floor, John, anything you'd like to just add to that sort of conversation there? Oh, look, I, I agree with what's been, been said, um, and I think that um, those that really don't adopt and don't really embrace the technology available are just going to get left behind. I think it's it's a, it's a step change that's coming, and you need to get on board. Yeah. yeah, really well summarised. I am going to open up for some questions before we come back and close. Now, it, it'll help. It doesn't matter. They don't have to be as good as mine, but it would help if they are. So um, just bear that in mind when you're asking, and we've covered off the valve in the plant room six times, all right? So we're talking about advancing the industry, all right? So open up to the floor. We've got Shannon with Roving Mike. There you go. One well, down the back. Oh, geez, mate. The call one out down the back. That's sensational. Just name is always good. Introduction. Uh, Nick Spencer, Watson Fitzgerald from South Australia. Predominantly to the two government guys up there, we see coming into contracts and, and doing the jobs that there is a mandate on the training, there's a mandate on skills, particularly in the Indigenous area. What's stopping a mandate on technology from being in your contracts and driving the industry that way? Well, that, that's exactly what we've seen. I've never seen we're... Queensland let Victoria go first. <laughs> yeah, but, no, but thank you, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what we're doing with updating our contracts at the moment. So it will be um, default uh, that you'll need to use technology um, and you'll have to have some very good reasons why you want to go around it. And also part of the secret to what we're trying to do here is to integrate that within the contracts, not have it as a bolt-on because it shouldn't be a bolt-on. It's, it's digital, it's an enabler, it's a, it's a tool. It's not a thing over there that sits in the corner and does something on its own. Um, it, it really is the secret to how do you make projects more efficient and get that transparency between contractor and government there. Nick, you're absolutely right. In, when Crossroad Rail started, one of the key things was actually getting um, technology front and centre. So in all the briefings we did to um, all the contractors, it, it wasn't a question of, can we? It was you must. Right. Um, I led the Queensland uh, Digital Enablement Policies uh, principles for BIM implementation up to 2020. One of the key things we did in that was say technology was part of the contract. Right. So and that created like you know the state as big as Queensland when you got mum and dad builders in Cairns going you know you you your shiny bums from the south you wouldn't have a clue what goes on up here, but yet. You know, some of their apprentices were saying, wouldn't it be good if we could get all the information on this thing? Mm. Right? That would really help in our day-to-day -day jobs if we could get what our work program was going to be on our phones. So there was a change, there is a change, and we did mandate it. Great, great answers, guys. And great question, Nick. Well done. Um, is there any other questions on the floor? Because we are favouring the, the fantastic audience we've got here as well as uh, just slightly ahead of the virtual questions. But... Um, hands up in the air. Esmir. Yes, thank you. Yes, my name is Esmir. I'm one of the BIM modeler. 
Um, the struggle that I've seen across, because I've, I had a chance to work with several companies, starting with Lacombe's like, down to uh, smaller mobs, and it's the software as well as the cost associated to it, mm. training as well as uh, implementation. Uh, what can government do to help out in that way? I'll go first this time. So, Pimet Piles <laughs> is looking for a, a couple of million dollar grant for training, just so put that in. <laughs> So certainly from the, from the Queensland Government point of view, we recognise that um, for smaller contractors there was that threshold that you had to um, you know, invest in technology and then if you weren't investing and you didn't get the work, you know, was that going to be a, a, a problem? Um, what we said was that we didn't mandate it for the very small contractors but we were mandating it for the bigger tier one, tier two companies. Right? Because then they would use some of the smaller bespoke contractors to do work and our requirement was that they then had to ensure all the way through their contracts down to the subcontractors that the same technology was going to be used. So a different sort of approach where we mandated the requirement of what we were looking for but it then had to flow down into all areas of the contract base. Good answer. Thank you. Um, Anna? Just uh, come over this side. You got it. You got one there. Thanks, Shannon. Yep. One sec. <laughs> You're moving like a gazelle, mate. You're <laughs> really... <laughs> Thanks. It's Anna from Cab Pro Systems. So I'd like to hear from the collected wisdom of the panel. Um, we've all seen stats that in the last 30 years, construction's not kept up with a lot of the other sectors in innovation. And I'm hearing from people like John and Andrew that if companies don't get on board with technology and innovation now, they're going to get left behind. What do you think is occurring now that's going to cause the rather laggard construction industry to actually do this, whereas in the last 30 years they've managed to get away with not doing it? I think it'll be around two things. I think the first will be the efficiencies that can be gained by using technology to design it and um, construct it virtually before you actually have to construct it on site. So what we were seeing particularly in cross rail, and remember, you know, we've got 5.9 kilometres of underground rail, so you couldn't actually, you know, think how you're going to do it and then suddenly push it down near the ground. You had to look at it virtually before you're actually building it underground. So there was a big embrace of the way that technology was going to be used in that instance. I think the really key thing there is that um, technology can reduce risk that means you don't have to have as much contingency that you need to hold to manage that risk. Therefore, that helps in the financing of projects. Right? That's, a, that's a long, longer argument. But I think that over time, um, the market will price technology in as a de-risking mechanism, right? which I think will then improve outcomes. And then, you know, just by the market forces, companies will then say, well, if we want to reduce risk or we want to reduce the contingencies we have to hold, we need to be on this technology bandwagon. Um, and it's not a bandwagon. We actually need technology because we use it in our private lives. We've got to use it in our professional lives. I'm just going to... Uh, great question. I might just go to, to John and Murray for a little yeah, bit I'll, of... I'll uh, a little bit of mayo on top, mate, or something, with cherry on top. But we... Um, so, traditionally, we would put out a, a design brief for a building and how that actually came about would be very much down to the, to the builders that we, we take on but we've been through the process for the last few years of digitising how we actually manage and maintain our assets so we're after data hmm. and so now we're specifying the data that we want but we don't want to be having to import lots of data when it's finished we want it to get it we want to understand the data sets through the construction process and import them into our digital asset register. So because we're asking for those data sets, technology has to be used. So I think that's what's also going to drive. I think that, that we're getting a bit smarter about what our outcomes need to be. And I think that's going to drive the industry to say, OK, so if we're designing digitally and the client wants the data sets, then we have to use the technology to make that happen. Mm. Good point. Yeah, um, I, I think it's an interesting point about about uh, technology being a risk mitigation, because I think there's no question there is. Um, I, I suspect it's more of 
It's more a ticket to the game, though. So I'm not sure if there's any particular advantage. Um, for instance, we're, we're, um, we're developing um, a, uh, a large station at Martin Place in Sydney with you know, a 39 and a 29 storey building above. And a lot of the more difficult uh, construction of the towers has all been simulated uh, mm -hmm. and built virtually uh, to iron out a lot of the kinks, and particularly the jump steel, et cetera, on the North Tower. Now, for us, that's really more a ticket to the game mm -hmm. uh, in terms of safety, and it's about doing that more effectively uh, rather than uh, reducing any risk contingency, to be yeah, honest. Sure. Um, but but it's, a, it's a very interesting point, and I could see at some point in the future we could end up there. The challenging thing, I think, for this is that this is all well and good for the large contractors. So for the mm. CPBs of the world and the lend leases of the world and, and the multiplexes and you know, the big tier ones and maybe some of the tier twos. But that's not the whole industry. There's, no. there's a whole, and there's a swag of other construction companies, let alone the whole supply chain. And that's why I think that you know, the, only, the only way you're really gonna get, give the industry a kick up the backside and start to shift this whole productivity thing is to is to mandate these in some areas and provide some support, be it technology support, be it funding, be it training, be it all the above. Mm -hmm. And and you know, I'd really like to think that that uh, various states of Australia could get together and and agree mm -hmm. some approach, you know, for Australia. Mm -hmm. Because there's no point just Victoria doing it or or New South Wales doing it or or them both doing it but doing it differently and you know, you, there really needs to be some, uh, you know, get on the same page and try and push the industry forward, but I think it will need a push. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, agree. I know you didn't include the Republic of WA in that, uh, Murray, <laughs> but... Um, well, I thought that was the same. <laughs> no, no, that, that, that was beautiful. And on those words of wisdom, well, we're going to close off the panel in the interest of on-time departure, but um, can I just thank our, our four panellists... Um, not just for their, um, their contribution there, but through their presentations and their support of the, of the um, Construction Innovation Forum as well as the BIM Mepols Initiative. So to Luke, Murray, John and Andrew, a heartfelt thank you. And uh, we're on time for our, our break at 12 or, or whatever hour of the day that is in your part of the world. So thanks, uh, hands together for our panellists.